Excuse me. I need to get an, uh, <laughs> been here too long. First off, I need to get a motion uh, for the approval of the agenda. <laughs> we'll do that one. <laughs> Mr. Forsyth, Mr. Reagan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda is a, uh, we have a presentation by our St. Lawrence County Forester uh, regarding the Emerald Ash Borer. Aaron, are you uh, with us? And John. Yes, I'm here. Yes, sir, Mr. Denisha, I'm here. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, there was a PowerPoint uh, sent over earlier today. I was wondering if I could get that up. Yeah, coming. Yeah. On the way. Thank you. All right, so this will be an update um, on the Emerald Ash Borer and its current status in St. Lawrence County. Uh, next slide, please. So the Emerald Ash Borer is an exotic beetle that was first discovered in the United States near Detroit, Michigan in 2002. Uh, it is native to parts of Russia, Mongolia, China, Japan, North and South Korea, and Taiwan. It is believed that EAB arrived in the United States on solid woodpacking material uh, carried in cargo ships or on airplanes uh, through international trade. Next slide. EAB has spread far and wide to 35 states and five Canadian provinces since 2002. The movement of firewood and other timber products enables these beetles to travel further and faster than it can naturally fly. Since its arrival in the United States, EAB has killed hundreds of millions of ash trees, cost municipalities and property owners billions of dollars on treatments, removals, and replacement of ash trees. Next slide. Um, EAB are species specific, affecting only ash tree species and are very destructive, um, killing almost 100% of the trees that they infest. EAB larvae uh, feed on trees cambium and phloem, which are the tissues that transport water and nutrients throughout the tree. So when the AB larvae damages these tissues, it causes the trees to starve to death. Next slide. So some signs and symptoms of EAB um, are canopy thinning and decline, the presence of epicormic shoots or water sprouts, blonding from woodpeckers feeding on EAB larvae and flecking off the bark, um, bark, bark splits from larvae galleys lifting and separating the bark from the cambium layer, and then the distinctive S-shaped or serpentine galleries underneath the bark. Next slide. Um, so EAB can naturally spread anywhere from a half mile to three miles per year. Um, and this is dependent on ash density, EAB population size and topography of an area. Um, and ash trees typically die within three to five years after infestation. Um, which is also dependent on EAB density, um, tree vigor, and site characteristics. So the map to the right shows the current known locations of EAB in St. Lawrence County as of August 1st of this year. And currently, EAB is naturally spreading at a rate of one to two miles per year in St. Lawrence County. Um, though this rate is of dispersal could change if infested material is transported to new locations, so essentially the movement of firewood. So within seven to eight years, EAB could be widespread throughout the county. So to give you an example, um, EAB could reach the village of Canton in two to three years, and then ash trees would start to decline and die th three to five years after that. So it could be expected to see dead ash trees in Canton within five years. Next slide, please. Um, here are some hot pool resources that provide general information about EAB, some online resources um, to help with EAB management, such as determining ash treatment and removal costs, how to report EAB, and some more in-depth information regarding current scientific research and studies. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> Mr. Akers. Yes, Aaron. So 
it seems like uh, the ash tree will be demised. What do you expect? To, uh, what species will replace the ash tree here in St. Lawrence County? What uh, will take its place? Um, depending on how it all, it's kind of dependent on ash densities um, per stand. So, and then what kind of seed bank is underneath? Um, invasive species have a really high potential to take over, um, just because they can outcompete all the other native species, um, and they typically occur um, where ash trees are. So that early successional species, when they come up. Um, in terms of climate change and soil temperatures, red maple will probably be a strong competitor um, as they're the only ones who can stand uh, soil temperature increases. So I would assume red maple um, and in invasives, unfortunately. So the ash trees in China, some of the ash trees have developed immunity. Do you expect that to happen here in St. Lawrence County? Or in the United States? Um, currently, there's a lingering ash project underway, and they're finding about one in a thousand ash trees um, actually have some level of resistance. Um, that being said, when EAB moves into an area, the population is so, the density is so high, even those resistant trees can't survive that kind of impact. Um, so essentially, after EAB comes through, kills all those ash trees, um, potentially you'll be able to see trees that come up that are slightly resistant after and potentially could survive um, after that EAB initial wave and populations are lower. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Yep. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Sure, uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Burke. Uh, Aaron, uh, you're continuing to work on the uh, Emerald Ash Borer, is that true? Uh, even, even though the offices are, are limited to, uh, in capacity? Correct. What, what municipality are you working with? Um, so We've actually have not stopped working um, as far as monitoring efforts. Um, the EAB task force, which John Tenenbush will talk about um, a little later, uh, St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division, um, Franklin County Soil and Water, National Grid, DEC, uh, USD APHIS, Sleal Prism, and the Forest Service have all continued um, their monitoring efforts, and they're actually helping us out in this area quite a bit. Thank you, Aaron. Legislator Haggard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no idea. There are a lot of trees in St. Lawrence County. I have no idea what percentage are ash. Do you have any idea of how many trees are ash trees in St. Lawrence County? Um, so within the St. Lawrence River Valley, roughly, it's a little bit higher. So you'd probably be looking at 10 to 15%. Um, once you get within the blue line or the Adirondacks, you'd be looking at around 8%. Thank you. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> Mr. Smothers. Yeah, what are we doing or should be doing to, as a, uh, municipalities or homeowners to prevent uh, accidents or damage from these trees suddenly falling down? Um, so one thing that has been um, actually completed in this past year was an inventory um, to see what the potential impacts would be on county routes. Um, and an inventory was taken to actually help with planning purposes. Um, as far as any specifics on that, the highway department is looking into what can be done with that um, information and how they can go about planning in the future to try and mitigate some of those um, hazards. Uh, anyone else have any, any questions for, for Aaron? Uh, I, I guess Aaron, uh, I know I was involved with the Emerald Ash Borer Task Force uh, 
couple of years ago, and we, we talked about the impact that it could have on, uh, on some of our Native American craftsmen. Uh, is, that, uh, is that still a uh, potential? Yeah, um, so the U.S. Forest Service is actually um, working closely with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, and they are finding um, potential black ash sites that they can try and um, keep alive as long as possible so they can maintain um, some level of resource um, into the future. They're utilizing uh, slam management, which is slow ash mortality. So they're putting in trap tree clusters around known black ash uh, resources in an attempt to uh, slow down how quickly EAB can infest those trees. Um, they've also looked into preserving material. So actually um, taking splints, pounding them out, um, and then freezing them. Um, they're getting about 20 years or so out of those for preservation. Another thing they're looking into is uh, sinking logs in lakes. So actually um, taking oxygen aspect out of it and trying to preserve logs underwater. Um, there's also alternative uh, basket making material that they're looking into. Um, other species, I know um, they've tried box elder as far as that for splints, um, and they might actually look into older methods, even uh, pre black ash, which would be white oak, um, which they actually used to use way back when uh, for splint basketry. Great. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that. Yep. Uh, John Tenbush, uh, do you, uh, I'm sure you have a, a part in this or some words that you'd like to uh, share with us. Yes, good evening. Um, I was asked to, uh, to talk about the, uh, the history of the, uh, the Emerald Ash Border Task Force. Can you folks hear me? I'm getting a weird reverb. But if you can hear me, all right. Yeah. Okay, fine. All right. Um, uh, emerald ash borers have been a concern in St. Lawrence County for at least a decade. In 2010, the Environmental Management Council invited Mark Whitmore, an entomologist at Cornell University, to present information about the emerald ash borer, its potential effects on ash trees in St. Lawrence County, and how local communities can plan to deal with its impacts. This session was attended by more than 70 people. Most of them were involved in the forestry industry. A little later on in 2014, the EMC coordinated with Cornell Cooperative Extension, the DEC, Soil and Water, SUNY ESF Ranger School, and students from Madrid Waddington Central School to conduct a survey of ash trees within the village of Waddington. Now the village of Waddington is, uh, is about one square mile. The survey included trees that were found on public and private property, it was completed in one day. Uh, in a total, 483 ash trees were observed, 53 were seen as potential hazards, which means if they became diseased and fell, they might bring down power lines or hit structures or impede rights of way. Another 24 ash trees were observed to be distressed. They had broken branches, missing bark, or other obvious signs of distress. Um, I mentioned that because we did another survey later and I'll, I'd like to uh, describe the differences. In 2015, the EMC coordinated with the Messina Nature Center and some of the partners from the earlier effort a year ago to uh, survey ash tree resources and liabilities along the trails at the Messina Nature Center. In 2016, Don O'Shea, who is a resident of Ogdensburg and a member of the Ogdensburg Tree Commission, and the vice chair of the Environmental Management Council invited Paul Hetzler, who was a horticulture and natural resources educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension, and me in my position as staff to the EMC to make a presentation to the Ogdensburg City Council about the hazards presented by EAB. After that presentation, we felt that an ad hoc committee should be created to keep attention on the problem. And so we started the EAB task force. We've had a total of 40 meetings since 2016. Our current email list includes more than 50 persons. 
In 2016, we traveled to Syracuse to meet with the Onondaga County EAB Task Force. There we also saw the effects of EAB infestation. We were taken on tours of several neighborhoods where the trees were just decimated. We also prepared a map of highly probable areas in St. Lawrence County where EABs were most likely to be found. And in fact, the first EABs found in St. Lawrence County were in one of those highly probable areas that we had marked. Uh, it was along the St. Lawrence River in the town of Hammond. In 2017, we coordinated with, again, EM, uh, the EMC, DEC, Cornell Cooperative Extension, and Canton students to survey ash trees found on public property within the village of Canton. Approximately 80 ash trees were observed. Note the difference with the results found in Waddington. I bring this to your intention because a lot of the efforts that our communities are doing are to minimize the liability for local municipalities. They're looking at trees on public property. They're, they're uh, dealing with trees on public property, but there's a lot of liability out there for ash trees that are on, on uh, private property. In Waddington, we found a total of 483 trees and Waddington's a little tiny community. I have to figure that in Canton, there are a lot more than 83 ash trees. The, the lot more would be on private property. And those trees are going to be diseased just like the trees on public property. Those trees are going to be uh, you know, dangerous just like trees on public property. And as, uh, you know, as a matter of policy, we should try to figure out how we might deal with that. And I don't have an answer to that. I'm just saying that is a persistent problem. The uh, EAB task force has helped partnerships develop between communities and organizations. Notable has been the willingness of national grid forestry staff to work with local communities to address ash trees in their rights of way. Such activity has halved the cost and liabilities faced by those communities. If I'm not mistaken, national grid has worked with the county and national grid is going to be dealing with ash trees on their rights of way, which is typically on one side of a road, that's that's why it halves the liability. So almost half, the county has 600 and some miles of, of roadway. Um, so the left side or the right side of that roadway is gonna be basically handled by National Grid. That's, that's a heck of a partnership. Also notable has been the partnership with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environmental Division. They have been active working on EAB issues they have been out ahead of us and we have learned a lot from them. We've also worked to help get EAB task force established in Franklin County. And we have provided direction to staff from Watertown and Jefferson County as they gear up to address EAB. Are there any questions? All right. That's okay. What's especially dangerous about this insect compared to other trees damaged by other types of insects in the way that the trees are, are apt to be killed and, and cause uh, liability issues, like you said? Uh, there, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is the, the relative speed with which the, uh, the emerald ash borer kills the tree, two to five years. Uh, another uh, factor is that these trees, um, ash trees that are killed by uh, emerald ash borers, and Aaron could probably explain the biology of this better than I can, uh, but they're prone to what is called catastrophic collapse, which means they basically fall apart with no precipitating incident. There's no, not necessarily wind. There's not necessarily any kind of a storm. A tree just collapses and no warning. Um, so that makes it particularly dangerous. And another reason is that ash trees, um, we had elm, Dutch elm disease 50 years ago. We had a uh, chestnut uh, 50 years ago. Ash trees were seen as a replacement for elm trees and chestnut trees in urban areas. 
So Aaron mentioned that in uh, uh, in St. Lawrence County, the, the uh, ash tree is maybe seven to 10 percent of the uh, tree cover. In our villages, in our more settled areas, they can be up to 25 percent coverage in, in those areas. So that's one out of every four tree. That's a relatively uh, large proportion of the tree cover. And so because they're uh, predominantly in these villages and things, they are therefore closer to uh, things that they could impact when they, if and when they catastrophically collapse. Does uh, anyone else have any? Yes, Legislator Haggard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Ten Bush, um, how would we mitigate this? I mean, is somebody going around checking these? Wh whose responsibility would it be to make sure that a tree isn't going to fall on somebody's head or their car or something? Would it be, as a board, what do we do? Well, uh, Ma'am, uh, as a board, um, I think the county is, is doing what it reasonably can in that uh, they're working with Aaron and National Grid and others mm -hmm. to do surveys of, of trees. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the trees that Aaron has surveyed, he is able to, he, since he's a, a, a trained professional forester, he's able to rate trees. So he has an idea as to, as to um, the degree of, of well, I don't I, I don't want to uh, put too fine a point on it, but he can't necessarily say this tree's ready to fall down now. I mean, um, but he can say that the trees, you know, this tree or the trees in this area are further along the process of deterioration than in some other areas, and that gives us. Uh, a direction to go. If, if Mr. Chambers sends a highway crew to take down a couple trees, he knows to go to this area rather than another area. Okay. Uh, and communities are, are, are doing, are starting to do uh, some of that as well. The survey work that we've done in Waddington and Canton, the village of Canton had their tree survey done professionally. The village of Messina has had a tree inventory done professionally. Ogdensburg has had a tree inventory done professionally. Potsdam is having a tree survey done professionally of trees on public property. But again, as I mentioned earlier, nobody has been able to figure out a public policy uh, solution to the problem of trees on private property. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for, uh, for either John or Aaron? Nope, it was for good. Thank you, John. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, sir. Good evening, all. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Jason. Uh, we have a uh, resolution authorizing the chair to sign accelerated transit capital reimbursement forms. Mr. Perkins and uh, Ms. Curran. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you very much. Good evening, all. Uh, the, the first resolution, uh, as, uh, as was read by Mr. Denisha, uh, talks about additional funding that's been made available uh, through the, uh, the Accelerated Transit Capital Reimbursement Program. And uh, these funds are, are going to be used to, uh, to offset local match contributions for buses and bus shelters. And this resolution allows the chair to sign uh, the forms to uh, receive those funds. Great, thank you, Jason. Anyone have any questions for Jason in regards to this resolution? <clears throat> there being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, the next resolution, uh, <clears throat> it's a resolution authorizing the chair to sign up to three one-year contract extensions with Volunteer Transportation Center, Inc. for first mile, last mile services. Ms. Curran and Mr. Fay. Jason. Thank you. 
Uh, VTC has been our, our partner uh, for uh, some time for first mile, last mile, and uh, they're really the only known provider that uh, that can provide for these services. DOT allows us to continue the uh, the contract with that uh, entity for up to an additional three years, uh, and that is uh, our request. Does anyone have any any questions uh, for Jason in regards to this resolution? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, the next resolution uh, is resolution authorizing the chair to sign bus advertising agreements. Mr. Akers and Ms. Curran. Jason. Thank you. Uh, we have a, 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 a great uh, partnership with, uh, with our transit provider and there is an opportunity to uh, receive revenue from the bus wrap uh, that uh, bus wraps that uh, adorn a number of the buses that are uh, that you see traveling around the county and uh, this essentially authorizes to sign agreements uh, to uh, realize that revenue. Great. Questions regarding this resolution? There being none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Gary. Uh, next resolution authorizing the chair to sign a subrecipient agreement with the North Country Housing Council Inc. for the delivery of the lead paint hazard reduction program. Mr. Forsyth and Ms. Curran. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you. Uh, as, as you know, the, uh, the HUD grant uh, has had some significant startup requirements startup tasks to, to get that, uh, that project up and running. One uh, requirement, however, that, that HUD does not have is for a formal subrecipient agreement. So at present, we do not have one. However, we, are, uh, we would like to, to proceed and secure a, uh, a subrecipient agreement with our, our provider, with the North Country Housing Council, because it allows us to, uh, to just have a better understanding of the scope of work, the roles and the responsibilities, and uh, identifies for potential conflicts of interest. We've used these successfully uh, with uh, the Housing Council for other grants and, and uh, feel that it would be a, an important, uh, important thing to, uh, to have for the lead grant as well, even though it is not a requirement. Uh, it, I think it's a good, uh, a good idea from a policy perspective. Questions or comments? <clears throat> to Jason in regards to this resolution. There being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And uh, Jason, uh, next, uh, would you uh, give us a discussion on the uh, lead grant update? Yes, happy to. Uh, we've, we've seen some progress and that that's making us us all uh, here in the office and with our partners uh, breathe a, a, a little bit of sigh of relief because we see the ball rolling a bit now. We don't have huge numbers yet, but we have had three successful projects completed to date, which, uh, which is great. Uh, we also have 14 applicants that uh, are, excuse me, applications that have basically a, a potential uh, individual or potential clients, individuals that have gone through the initial vetting process. Uh, that does not mean that they will be a, a successful client, but it, it's, the, it's the next step in, in getting them to that level. Uh, one thing that we are still finding frustrating or uh, will present uh, problems going forward is the incredible uh, costs associated with some of these uh, abatement projects. Uh, we have seen uh, costs anywhere from the uh, the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range for for uh, abatement in some homes. Uh, unfortunately, HUD only allows uh, for uh, well a twenty thousand dollar allotment per unit. Uh, it is. Uh, appealable though, and you can get up to $25,000. We have successfully appealed and, and have a project at, at 22.5. But uh, as we go forward, looking at some of these projects uh, that are uh, in, the, in the 60 to $70,000 range, it's just not feasible for us to do those projects with this program. 
we're hopeful that we'll be able to leverage some money from another grant program, the uh, a, a state uh, grant program. Uh, but that is still a, a work in progress in, in seeing how we can, we can do that. But uh, it is it is encouraging. We have some numbers, some completions. We have some numbers up. We need to find more projects that are, are within the uh, in the, the the price range where we can do the work. Uh, and not have to to uh, to step back from from really expensive projects. Uh, we also have uh, have uh, through the uh, the great assistance of public health have uh, done some rebranding a little bit of the advertisement that always needs to be updated to keep it fresh to keep the the, the word getting out there uh, in a different manner to uh, to uh, get as much uh, much. Uh, involved in as much understanding from the public as possible. Uh, we have also um, included a lead program information uh, at food distribution centers uh, and sites throughout the county uh, associated with the, uh, the COVID crisis. So that's just another, another opportunity to get the word out. Um, and uh, yes, we continue to meet on a, a regular basis with, uh, with our, our main partners, Public Health and uh, the North Country Housing Council. And we are gonna be moving to more of a, a regularly, uh, a more frequent uh, combined meeting where we can uh, all put our heads together, keep, our, keep the, uh, the ideas flowing about how to keep this project going forward. Good. Questions for, uh, <clears throat> questions for Jason? This, I guess the only uh, the only question I would have uh, is the uh, is the twenty is the uh, the twenty thousand dollar or twenty five thousand dollar figure that's attached to the grant is that realistic? Good question, Mr. Denisha. It, it's realistic in some parts of the country. Uh, what we find, and we all know, in Saint Lawrence County, we have a lot of uh, larger, older homes, homes that, uh, that are uh, occupied by individuals that are certainly eligible for this program. They, they have uh, children that, that may be uh, affected by lead paint. Uh, they may, because of the age of the homes, they, they no doubt have a, a large concentration of lead paint. And it's, uh, it, it's, when you have $20,000, you can do a, a, a unit in an apartment building. It's a lot more difficult to do a, a 3,000 square foot uh, house that was built in 1890. All right, thanks, Jason. That's about what I, uh, about what I expected. Is it, uh, no more questions? Very good. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, now we uh, on the Fair Housing Task Force. Yes, thank you. Just a, a very quick plug for an event that's coming up this Thursday. Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, we have a presenter, two presenters, uh, Sally Santangelo, the Executive Director of uh, Central New York uh, Fair Housing, and uh, Mrs. Griffith from the, uh, of the Legal Services of Central New York. Uh, they will be talking about the eviction process under COVID, and we've advertised it uh, pretty far and wide uh, for tenants, landlords, uh, the general public, anyone that, that uh, has any connection with, uh, with uh, tenants and, and uh, leases, uh, just as an information uh, opportunity, just to see what's out there from, uh, from the state and, and from the, uh, the legal side of things with regard to uh, the eviction process. Uh, so I do have uh, a link that I'm going to share with anyone people are interested in attending that. It will be recorded as well. So if uh, if you can't make 10 a.m. Uh, on Thursday, uh, it will be available after the fact. Thank you, Jason. Does anyone have any uh, any questions for Jason? <coughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, on to emergency services. Matt, are you with us? Yes, he is. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first resolution is a uh, resolution authorizing the chair to sign a contract with the New York State Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Services to accept a fiscal year 20 grant and modifying the 2020 budget for the Office of Emergency Services. Mr. Perkins and Mr. Lightfoot. Go ahead, Matt. 
Uh, this is one of our yearly grants that we get uh, fiscal year 20. What this does is for other fees and services, uh, gives us money for our Spillman, our CAD maintenance and the technical equipment that uh, is going to help offset the cost for our interoperable equipment for uh, our new towers that we're building. Okay, anyone have any questions uh, for Matt in regards to this resolution? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. And next one is a resolution authorizing the chair to sign a contract with New York State Office of Homeland Security for fiscal year 20 emergency management performance grant. Mr. Lightfoot <coughs> and Mr. Sheridan. This one, here, this one here is another yearly grant. This one uh, helps offsets uh, of administrative costs in the office, salaries of the administrative staff. Okay, any questions on, uh, on this resolution for Matt? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Gary. <coughs> and the, uh, the last resolution would be modifying the budget for emergency services for overtime costs. Mr. Fay and Mr. Forsythe. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, this is to move $8,000 out of contingency into our uh, overtime line to offset uh, some of the overtime that we occurred that we're hoping that will get us through to the end of the year. Any, any questions? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. And uh, <laughs> the last one, Matt, would be uh, the, uh, just a brief overview or discussion on the interoperability towers uh, update, if you would, please. All right, uh, this is originally a 45 minute presentation, but I condensed it down to two minutes. <laughs> that's, that's very, very, very wise. Thank you, Matt. All right, first one we'll talk about is Governor. Governor is uh, 280 feet tall, located by the, behind the transfer station there on Route 11. The tower is pretty much 99% complete, powers on. Uh, we do have some of the equipment in the office. We did get some uh, quotes for antennas and cabling to put this on. The only thing we're waiting on is the lights at the top of the tower to get hooked up, uh, start up on the generator and the HVAC system. And then as soon as the contractor signs off, we'll be able to uh, put the antennas up and put some equipment on. Hopefully it'll help us on that end of the county. Next is Wannington. Wannington is currently being worked on uh, 270 feet tall. As you see in the pictures there, that's the foundation and the far, the round circles where the tower is going to sit. Uh, the big one's the shelter, and the other two is the generator pad and the uh, tank pad. Uh, they're starting the steel. They actually started today setting steel. So I wasn't going to get a chance to get out there and get a picture of the steel actually going on today, but uh, hopefully we'll have, be able to get that to you at some point. Uh, completion date for this is October 31st. Uh, Hammond. Hammond's been our difficult one. That was the first one we started. We ran into a little bit of issues with some moisture in the ground. Uh, as you can see, the arrow in the back of the picture, that's where the discoloring of the soil was. So we figured there might have been some groundwater there. So being that said, we end up having to go back to Sabre. They are where we bought the steel from. They gave us the specs for the foundation. They had to redesign the foundation. Uh, it was originally 32 feet by 32 feet by six or two foot thick. Uh, there's six foot of dirt or soil on top of the foundation. Then the round piers come up and the tower gets attached. Because of the chance of buoyant conditions, they actually expanded the pad to 37 by 37 by two foot. So we had to do a change order for that extra five foot each way in the rebar uh, and work up a solution where we can use the rebar that was already purchased on site. So we just had to do that. We're currently waiting for Midstate to send over. They sent us the change order, order over. And I asked him to sign a copy, send it to us so we can get it signed and we can get the guys mobilized on the site and get going. Uh, Kimball Hill, just a quick one. This one has been done. As you see, there's two towers. One on the right is the newer one. There is some stuff on the one on the left. Uh, we're trying to get all our stuff off there and some of the vendors off on the new one. Currently, we have two electric bills and two heat bills. Uh, we want to condense that down to one. Uh, there's no reason to keep them both going uh, when we only need the one. Uh, Cranberry Lake. Cranberry Lake, so we just recently had some issues. That, as you see, uh, is the tower is owned by American Tower Incorporated. Uh, that is basically an AT&T rents most of the space. We do have a repeater on the site with a small antenna. Uh, some of you know AT&T got permission to turn up some of their signal strength. Uh, by doing that, it kind of shut that repeater down. We're not able to transmit off of it. 
So right now we ended up moving them to Mount Morris. Mount Morris is in Tupper Lake. Uh, it's a little bit further away but uh, on Big Tupper, but uh, we're able to hit the repeater. We're able to tone them out in the pager's trip and the siren's trip. So we are currently working with Blue Wing to come up with some solution for the Cranberry Lake area to be able to get something more permanent in that area. Uh, we move on to Big Tupper. This is one of our repeater sites, Repeater 8. Uh, you can't really see, but right there is our little itty bitty antenna with two little loops on it. That's ours, this directional point towards our uh, side of the county. Any questions, comments, concerns? Thank you very much. Any <laughs> <laughs> hey, questions from that? You don't have to take questions right there. <laughs> if we lost. Thank you, Matt. John, did you John's have a question? question. <sighs> yes. Uh, um, and, and it doesn't have to be answered tonight, but I would like an update on our attempts to market the space on the towers. We currently are working with uh, one of the vendors for one of the sites. Um, the county attorney has a tentative contract. Ruth and I have already met uh, last week about it. Um, they're waiting for an update. So there will be some updates. We are moving forward with that. Uh, one of the things that concerns we do have is over this happening in Cranberry Lake, we don't want to if a cell phone vendor does come on one of the towers and we end up with a lot of interference, uh, we got to be able to them turn it down or get off or something. So that, those are things that we're working up. Well, we are making progress with that. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Matt. Thanks, guys. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Tim. The, uh, I have a resolution declaring October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This foresight and Mr. Reagan. Go ahead, Tim. So this is a yearly resolution I put forth on behalf of the uh, county's Domestic Violence Task Force. Um, seeking uh, you guys to, to declare October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, this year's theme is seek justice, enforce victims' rights, and inspire hope uh, because of COVID and social distancing, they won't be doing their table in the lobby of the house. But they're going to focus more on some media attention. Um, but other than that, uh, that's it. Questions for Tim on this resolution? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Gary. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. And Mike. Okay, uh, the first resolution uh, is a um, uh, just moving some money around our central stock oh. room. Uh, no oh, increase. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ever a resolution mod <laughs> modifying the plan. I know you want to get out of here, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go Resolution modifying the 2020 budget for the Governmental Services Department for COVID-19 response. Mr. Forsyth, Mr. Say. Okay, Mike. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no, it's, uh, we're just moving some money around the central stock room accounts, so no increase in local costs, just so we can um, uh, pay some of the appropriations we did for uh, sanitation supplies for the COVID response. Any, uh, any questions for Mike on this resolution? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. And uh, the the next one would be a resolution uh, regarding adoptions of records retention schedule. Uh, Mr. Perkins. Mr. Akers. <clears throat> okay. Um, the New York State Archives is responsible for providing uh, records management and retention schedules. Um, the responsibility of the county is to adopt these so we can officially um, dispose of records. Uh, recently, the State Archives has combined all of the different ones uh, for the counties, villages, uh, school districts into one, which is now called LGS-1. Uh, there is a copy of that on Google Drive if anybody would like to review it or look at it. Um, and this um, resolution just adopts this as required. 
Any questions for Mike regarding this resolution? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And Johnny. Good to be here. Hello there. There she is. Hey, uh, we have a, uh, the first resolution is uh, authorizing, uh, uh, authorization to revise Medicare Part B reimbursement policy for St. Lawrence County. Did I get a motion of Mr. Forsythe and Mr. Sheridan? Go ahead, Johnny. So in 1985, the Board of Legislators established a reimbursement policy for retirees and their spouses for Medicare Part B premium reimbursement. And in 2012, the Board of Legislators adopted policy changes related to eligibility and reimbursement levels. Um, and if you will recall, last year, at the end of last year, we had a larger number than usual of retirees that did not provide HR with the documentation needed by the deadline prescribed in the policy to receive the Medicare Part B reimbursement. So after about the third retiree calling to ask about the retro reimbursement, I brought the issue to the board chair. And at that time, we decided we needed to bring it to the issue and the policy to the full board to discuss and possibly revise. Our discussion at that time led me to believe that there should be no deadline for reimbursement and no documentation required. The county treasurer feels it is important to have both in place. So I've revised the policy to expand the timeline for required documentation from six months to 12 months and reduce the number of reimbursement payments from two to one a year with the deadline of November 15th. Um, and so um, I believe the revised policy was provided for your review. And I'll, I don't know if Dave Forsyth has anything he wants to add to this or if there's any discussion about it. At seven o'clock, I would have. No, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. You did good. Is, uh, I know everyone's, uh, it was included with the, the packet. Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding this resolution? Uh, there are no questions. I would just comment. Uh, John's going. Okay, John, Mr. Burke. The, um, that having a deadline once again would mean that people beyond the deadline, we'd be faced with the decision of, of not reimbursing them. Is that correct? policy division just ends the deadline it gets them um it moves from six months to a, to a year deadline and actually almost a two-year deadline when when all is done and said um it could be a two-year deadline um but but that was just and the only reason i didn't put i didn't take the deadline out completely is because the treasurer really feels that there needs to be that deadline in that documentation as well mm -hmm. Um, just a follow-up question. Would we have a chance to, uh, I mean, I, I assume that we would have a report for anybody who is going to lose reimbursement and be able to talk about it at the time. Is that correct? I, I can certainly bring those issues up now. Absolutely. One by one as they, as they come along. Thank for you. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Any, uh, any other questions? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, the next, uh, actually, there's uh, the next resolution. Uh, actually, there's uh, B and C, but actually they're the same. With the uh, the only exception being the uh, uh, the phase in time. So, uh, I guess. Uh, the, the, the resolution uh, authorizing change to retiree pharmacy prescription copays and directs the Human Resources Department to adjust retiree prescription copays to keep pace with CSEA union negotiated uh, pharmacy copays for active employees. Um, and Mr. Forsythe and Mr. Lightfoot. Johnny, you want to talk about this, please? Sure. 
So for several years, Orange County utilized the retiree drug subsidy program offered by CMS, which reimbursed healthcare plan sponsors, us, for a portion of eligible RX expenses, which enabled San Lawrence County to obtain more generous drug coverage for retirees while keeping copays at low levels. In January of 2016, St. Lawrence County switched from RDS to the Employer Group Waiver Program, which is um, termed EGLIS, which provided increased benefits like catastrophic high cost RX protection and saved St. Lawrence County money, more money in prescription drug costs. Um, I believe this is one of the reasons why RX copays were not increased over the years, with the other one being the coordination of the timing of of the of the change. So for a retiree RX uh, for retiree copay changes, they can only be done on January 1st of any given year. Um, and there also has to be a 90 day notice to CMS. So I believe those two factors played in the, the role of why St. Lawrence County retiree RX copay started lagging um, the, the active employee population. And that was as early as 2010. Um, so this came up a while back and, and somebody, that, you know, you guys were wondering what happened and, and that's what I believe happened. So the health care committee has recommended increasing the retiree RX copay to match the active employee population. And the current rate differences are between $8 and $20 per prescription, depending on the tier. And so I have prepared two resolutions um, for your consideration tonight. And one moves retirees to match CSEA rates effective 1121. And the other moves the, them incrementally um, a $3 to $5 increase over the next four years to match CSEA rates by January 2024. And the reason I um, put up both of these is because I recall this um, discussion uh, a couple years ago when it was with, when it was on the board floor. And um, there was some interest in a phased in approach, um, but the healthcare committee would let, wanted me to bring both um, just, you know, for discussion purposes and, and preference. I, I don't know, Dave, if I've missed anything or if you want to add anything. Uh, any questions, uh, Ms. Terminelli? Johnny, can you just define what you mean by lagging? It says that the retirees started lagging the active employee population. Yeah. So the retirees co-pays right now for generic are $7, while for the CSEA active, they're $15. For the retirees um, brand name or formulary, they're $15. And for CSEA, they're $35. And then for the non-formulary, there are thirty dollars for retirees and fifty dollars for the active population. Okay, so would um, is the reason in the past that um, the retirees description the copay crisis? Sorry, there was a lot of extra noise there. Is the reason in the past um, that retirees have not? They haven't seen a, a an increase in their copay. Uh, was that would that have been considered because maybe they were on a fixed retirement income that didn't get raises and other things? I'm just wondering if a third option is to not choose either of these. So that's definitely a third option for me. Um, but I believe that the reasons were because we had we had these um these these uh Medicaid these CMS pro plans programs that were in place that allowed us to get these subsidies that allowed us to keep the retiree rates down. In fact, the, the first program that we were in, um, that was part of the program that they gave us subsidies to do that specific thing, keep those rates lower. And then the second one was, um, you know, in 2016, we switched over to a new group and that's because it offered more benefits um, for the retirees. Um, and it kept the drug prescription costs down as well. Um, and so, I believe those two reasons is one of that's one of the reasons why we kept them lower. The other one being the coordination of the timing of it. So, like we just finished um, CSEA contract negotiations in March, so we couldn't have changed 
the retirees at the same time because we have to wait until January. So I think that there was that playing into it as well. And, and there might have been another another thought that, yeah, we should keep these lower because they're on a fixed income. And that I don't I wouldn't know I don't have that history. Mr. Burke. Johnny, what's the recommendation or Dave, what's the recommendation of the health committee? The uh, recommendation was to follow the CSEA guidelines. It's just, do you want to gradually work it in or do you want to do it all at once? Um, the only thing I'm, I'm concerned with a little bit with it, are we going to be able to make the 90 day for one one of 21? So what I would suggest is that if this, if the kids tonight determines that they want to make some kind of movement in those, in those RX, then I can um, tell proactive and um and tell them now tomorrow and we'll have the 90 days in um, yeah, it's still possible yeah. that the full board meeting there wouldn't be any change in your thought processes well i bet there'll be more people here than, than at this meeting for sure but um i have no issue either way it's just however the will of the board is i th i think it's right you know medicare does it every other year to to individuals, so you know, right is right. I think that's my opinion. <clears throat> Mr. Minnelli. Sorry, and I'm not well versed in this this kind of stuff, um, but it just seems to me I know, like as an educator, right? When we ne negotiate our contracts, um, we very much like to keep in mind the retirees and knowing that there's always going to be a cost of living adjustment for workers, and that there's always going to be raises that are um, that are calculated for current um, employees, and knowing also that the employer, when they're budgeting, <laughs> takes into account those those forecasted costs that they're going to incur by both their current employee benefit packages, but also the employee or the retired um, packages. And I just have a very difficult time. And I know to us, we might look at it and just say it's $5 here, $8 there, but the um, older population, older American population actually sees the highest cost associated with almost all of their prescriptions. And so I think that it's, um, difficult to to push out a cost to somebody that's living on a fixed income um, and is not getting raises just out of the blue. I just I'm just a little concerned about it. Other comments, questions? <clears throat> Legislator Haggard. I may or may not be one of these older Americans that Ms. Terminelli is talking about, OK? So. If the choice is we have to give them an increase, we're choosing between all at once, which I would be totally opposed to because that's going to shock them, or phasing it in, which I would go with. But I'm assuming that what Nicole was sort of referring to was not on the table, and that is absorbing the cost. We can't do that. Is that correct? either Johnny or Mr. Forsyth? As far as I'm concerned, it's up to the will of this board. So I know how I stand on it, but it's going to take eight votes one way or the other. So it's not an easy issue, no question about it. So. OK, OK, that answers my question. Thank you. Johnny, did you want to say something? OK. That's an option that's out there for sure. I mean, you guys can just say that you don't agree with the resolution and you're not putting it forward. So. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I guess uh, that is that is an option. Uh, so, <clears throat> how will we go about this, Ruth? Uh, we uh, obviously we have to choose. We have to choose one of these two resolutions. To increase the copay for retirees, uh, or we don't act on the resolution. 
Mr. Akers. Mr. Chairman, I would make the motion that we accept the uh, resolution, which includes the proposed retiree phase. In. So you, okay, you're uh, <clears throat> uh, you're making a motion to uh, that we accept the uh, uh, the second uh, the C. The, the, fa the phase in over over four years. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lightfoot, you're se second that motion. Okay, we have a uh, <clears throat> we have a motion on the table. It's been seconded uh, for the resolution. That's a uh, uh, actually would be the second one. It would be the uh, the phase in uh, over four years. Um, all those in favor of that resolution. Aye. 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 Are you having a discussion first? No. Is there a discussion? We can, John. Well, that's the way it's like. supposed to. Well, well, if that's if you like, that's what we'll do. That's not well, what you. That's how it's supposed to work. A motion, <laughs> then discussion. <laughs> That's better at seven thirty. It's only the ten thirty. Our new parliament there. Larry, Larry. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, go ahead, John. It, it since we're, you know, since the proposal, the motion on the floor, is to do the phase in. I mean, we're under no, we're under no, uh, timeline now. Is that correct? I mean, we don't. We don't have the 90 day timeline. Uh, if we, if we, if, if the vote carried and went with that, we don't have the 90 day timeline. Is that correct, Johnny? So I, I would, I would, what I was hoping to do is it, if you felt, if this committee felt that it was, you were going to make a decision to make the movement tonight and that you felt it was going to go forward in the full board then I would give them their, I would tell them tomorrow so we hit the 90 day timeline. Um, I mean, I, was, I we can always back out and say, well, you know what, we're not doing it. Um, but I can well, meet 90 day timeline by tomorrow. For, for my part, um, I, I'd, I'd like a little bit more feedback from the people or the, the, the union, the people that represent the retired. I, I'd like just a little more information uh, before I weigh in and and if I'm forced to vote on it tonight, I wouldn't vote to support it. Mr. Denise. <clears throat> Mr. Lake. Those that are retired are not represented by the union. No kidding. That, that, that's true, Joe, but but the union has uh, uh, is has a closer finger on the pulse than most of us do. Mr. Akers. So I, I would urge that we move ahead on this. As you read in the resolution, uh, the lagging has started as early as 2010, which is 10 years ago, and 2013 for other groups uh, based on this. <coughs> on the contracts that we have settled, the health care is the same for this year and all the contracts, the increased contribution occurs in 2021. So this would coincide. My preference, John, would be to actually uh, put in the full amount. And, and uh, but as I'm getting older and getting closer to that age of 65, I'm thinking maybe I'd like a phase in myself. So I think this is a compromise. I wish that the committee had submitted one or the other. They did not, uh, out of respect for the wishes of the board. So I think we need to make a decision tonight on the resolution, whether we want to do a phase in, a table it, or the other. So I'm recommending uh, uh, this one here where it's a phase in. I think it's fair. It allows uh, for changes. Gradual. Thank you. Any other comments? Discussion? On the resolution. Okay, there being none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
We uh, let's do a, uh, a roll call vote, please. This is a roll call vote on the second page, the oh, second yeah. resolution. Yeah, phase in. Phase in. No. Piaco? No. Burke? No. Arquette? No. Terminelli? No. Reagan? Yes. Forsyth? Yes. Lightfoot? Yes. Sheridan? Yes. Smithers? Yes. Denisha? Yes. Wickens? Yes. Nine yes, five no, one absent. Uh, motion is carried. So moving on next to the Vacancy Review Committee, uh, we have Amy Dona with us this evening. Uh, she will speak to the position for Assistant Conflict Defender. Hi, Amy. Hi, how is everyone? Um, so I'm asking to fill the Assistant Conflict Defender position. It'll become vacant October 1st um, due to a relocation of one of our employees to New York City. Um, this employee primarily handles the family court a family, a family court caseload. All the attorneys in our office have family court and criminal court caseloads, um, but this attorney primarily handles um, a lot of the neglect and abuse matters. Um, a lot of the cases are scheduled for trials and hearings coming up, so it's very important that we're able to fill this position so that we can start reassigning within the office, which we're doing, but also have full staff again. Um, the local courts have been reopened as of August. Um, we're doing virtual and in-person court appearances in all the courts now. Um, so family court and county courts in person as well as virtual appearances. Local courts are still in person and we do have coverage issues for our office. Filling this position, you know, we'll still have some coverage issues, but really we just need to fill this position. So I'm just asking to approve that. Any questions for Amy? Okay, thank you, Amy. Thank you. And the second department we have this evening is uh, Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Bigwork. Good evening or good night or whatever time it is right now. Um, <laughs> Dark. Uh, for you hockey fans, Tampa's up three, three to two, just so you know. Yeah. There you go. So I have uh, three vacancies, two in the jail, uh, one on the road. I have two positions that have come open, one from resignation, and one from retirement. Uh, one retirement has been since August 11th. Uh, the second just uh, came vacate a week ago. Uh, the University Commission of Corrections, it's uh, 56 mandated staff. Uh, the two, uh, well, leaving brings me down to 54, so I need to fill these two just to maintain the New York State staff. Uh, the role patrol position, uh, an eight-year officer's decided to leave law enforcement for many different reasons. Uh, he's going into business, believe it or not. I don't know if that's good or bad. Probably good. Uh, but I need to fill that position. Um, I have a prospective candidate right now, so that'll save, obviously, in cost of academy and training 
if we can get that person to uh, lateral over. So I'm looking to fill these three positions. Questions for the sheriff? Jail count, sheriff? 92 and growing. Any other questions? Thank you, sheriff. Oh, John's got one. Go ahead, John. Brooks, just just not not for tonight, but wondering if we could get an update on the uh, that 201 regulation that came down from the state uh, that that all the police departments had to come up with a plan. Uh, just wondering if you could give us an update. Uh, and again, not not tonight. It's late, but if and maybe the next yeah. time. Uh, so next just time. briefly, I because I talked to the. County Administrator about this today. Um, I'm meeting with the chiefs Wednesday uh, to talk about this. Uh, each municipality has to have a plan. Uh, the counties have to have a plan. Um, my plan is for the county end of it is to have four uh, county forums throughout the county. Uh, I'm trying to get Norfolk as one, uh, Hewelton as another, Edwards as another, and Parishville Colton area so I could kind of hit four corners of the county where the public don't have to travel very far. Uh, they can come and speak. Um, I'll do a PowerPoint presentation for you guys, but it'll be a little more updated. Um, but after I talk with the chiefs on Wednesday, I should know a little more, but I am planning in October, November, having public forums and that's a part of the uh, executive order that has to be fulfilled. Other than that, uh, just to let you guys know, and I let the county attorney know this also, uh, our agency just got accredited last week. Uh, we passed through the state, which is a big feather in our cap. Uh, I'd like to thank the undersheriff and and uh, Deputy Lee Filiatra, our, our uh, accreditations manager. Those they put a lot of time in, along with our other road patrol officers, uh, to make this happen. Uh, part of that accreditation, uh, part of it, accreditation really fills a lot of the boxes for this new executive order, John. So. Being accredited is huge. Uh, our, ourself and Canton PD are the only two law enforcement agencies in the whole county. They're accredited. Uh, the standards are very high. There's 103 standards that you have to meet or you don't get accreditation. Um, so we're, we're really checking a lot of boxes with our accreditation. But the, the forums coming up in October, November are really what uh, needs to be done. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Leslie Haggard. Just a quick follow up to what John brought up, um, Sheriff. I did have the pleasure of speaking to the under sheriff about this. I don't know if he passed that along to you. He did. Um, great, that's good. Um, so there will be people in the communities involved, not just from these like town halls, but actually working on policy and stuff with you well, yeah i mean I, I don't know if you're saying working on policy i would say they have input in the policy um, right but That's what yeah they'll have some input they have input uh, we want them to have input um but like i said we're, we're our policies are are really already there for if you mm -hmm. read uh, executive order 203 uh and it's quite extensive it's like 120 pages um but we, we we've already accomplished as in many sheriffs of the state have already accomplished many of these uh, conditions for the executive order. Uh, the part that really needs to be, as I said, needs to be accomplished is these public forums and their input. Um, and I've got, uh, I don't know, I've probably had eight to 10 people that have already called me personally and said, I wanna be part of it, which is great. More, more yeah. than Mary, uh, we wanna see a lot of input from the public, uh, different perspectives, different people. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to take all their input uh, and we're fulfilling the executive order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for the sheriff? Thank you, sheriff. Thank you. Thanks, sheriff. And <clears throat> report. Okay, so I will move through uh, the items I have to report out to you this evening. Uh, I will begin with uh, the letters on your agenda, and um, 
Then I will move through a quick update. I have transfer of funds for you and about four items to give you updates on <clears throat> and wrap that up. First item tonight is the review that was requested last month with regard to DSS legal. And I can put it in these terms. There are five of each. There's approximately five requests being made. There are five actions already being taken. And there are five recommendations to consider. So I'll walk down through them quickly. The five requests, and these are a compilation of what I've received from Cindy and certainly a number of things that, that many of you have been contacted about. There's been requests uh, with regard to the increase in workload and presence in court, both as a result of returning from COVID as well as having many parts of the family court to present to. So there's been requests for additional attorney staff, additional support staff, increased salaries for these attorneys to contract out the appeals work. Currently there are 22 pending for the Department of Social Services and to have support matters managed by the county attorney's office. So those, in summary, are the requests. Actions that have already been taken include the supervising attorney, grade and title, so that would mean an increase to salary, has already occurred. A promotion of a social services attorney to the senior position of social services attorney has also occurred. The compilation of the social services attorneys that were vacant for a period of time, one has been filled on September 8th, and the final current position will be filled tomorrow, September 22nd. So after tomorrow, they will begin the process of onboarding a complete staff of the existing positions in DSS legal. There's also an intern program with one current intern on on uh, reporting to assist in the department with a current practice order in place and a bar exam schedule, as I understand. As Cindy mentioned when she was present with us this evening, and she certainly is here as well, she's also taken up weekly meetings scheduled on Monday mornings with the supervisors of Children's Services, Child Protective, as well as legal. In her terms, to look at the process to continue moving cases through and to make sure that things don't get caught or hung up in the process to move them through. So with the knowledge that we have at the time, they can prepare accordingly. Now onto the recommendation. As mentioned, I'd like to recommend securing the full complement of attorney staff. As I mentioned the dates, they should be at full staff by the end of this week. And review the gaps that remain after they've had an opportunity to work together and to also uh, move into the, the post-COVID court appearances that are occurring now. I would also recommend that either one additional social services attorney be added or that they contract out the appeals work. In the research that Cindy provided to me, there are two counties that contract out the appeals work. And as far back as we can tell, the appeals work has been completed by one attorney in the office. So I would present that as an or scenario at this time, that either they could have a contract put out to obtain those services and a resolution be approved by the board to sign a contract, or they could opt to hire that fifth attorney at this time. The next recommendation would be for, and this would be uh, to look at this for one year, if the contract for appeals was the option, to contract that out for one year and make a determination based on the staff if in fact they could take that work back or if it best be outside the county with a contract attorney. The next recommendation would be with regard to support matters. For one year, authorize a contract with the county attorney's office so that the work being done by the county's attorney by the county attorney's office could be reimbursed by the state. And again, after one year, Evaluate that option to determine if that work at that time could be taken back or if it best resides in the county attorney's office. The next recommendation I would make is one that's extended to attorneys on staff already, though these attorneys are in the district attorney's office. Consideration currently for social services attorneys, so this is not for the senior or the general counsel, Currently, they, are, they exist salary-wise in band four. What we offer in the district attorney's office is a balance between band four and band five. 
Let me tell you what that means. Currently, the social services attorneys can be hired between a range of 63,000 and 81,000. This would allow that base to remain the same at 63,000, but it would give the opportunity upon a human resource review of training and experience for the opportunity for the top of band five to be 90,361. Now bear in mind, the senior social services attorney is also in band five. So with the expectation that that person, that position would supervise the others, they would always need to stay ahead of that position. And then finally, in 2021, include the net difference, as you've heard many times, this position, um, any of these positions in social services do have reimbursement attached to them. So include the net difference in the contingency account, which approximately at the rates we're working with right now, would be $20,868, so that once that review is conducted, after full staff has been achieved, and they've had a period of time to work together, and on my indication by the end of this year, we identify those gaps, and we have funding should it be warranted to add another position. What I will do is send all of the, uh, the recommendations, the current set status of request, and the actions already taken to you by email to review. I would also just mention that the current number of children in foster care, as Cindy might have mentioned, was 311. There are 26 children in institutional care. And just as, a, as a, by way of the expense associated with that, uh, the $1.1 million accommodation you made this evening for foster care has already spent, pardon me for not having it right in front of me, So far this year, $2 million budgeted, they've spent $2.5 million, and the 1.17 was modified at the committee level this evening to deal with the foster care expenses. Last year, we spent $3.39 million for foster care. The year before, 2.1, and most of the years going back to 2014, we spent approximately 1.6. So those are numbers that you can see a dramatic increase. I'm also working to get, and for many years, this office tracked the number of cases which they can be referred to in a variety of ways. What I can tell you is the numbers that we're looking at now in terms of child welfare orders are up at least a third. What I can also tell you is in child support, almost double. Certainly, we are uh, at the top of one of the lists that we prefer not to be at the top of, which is the volume in family court, I believe, is the top in the state. From that perspective, Cindy did speak to um, the ability to prepare. However, if you're told today that you need to show up tomorrow, I'm not sure 10 bodies are going to help. What I'd like to do is be able to bring these recommendations back, send these to you so that you can process these, as I've mentioned tonight, and then I could add a discussion item on the finance agenda where we can revisit these and any questions that you may have. I'll take any questions now or at the end of my report. Doesn't matter to me. Mr. Burke. Um, Ruth, uh, Cindy had mentioned that she had done some benchmarking with other DSS commissioners. Uh, and, I, and I guess, you know, w when you ask us to make decisions, I mean, there are certain pieces of information that stick in my mind, the ratio of, of 50 to 1 for children in placement, uh, which would mean uh, if we're at 311, that would be a little over six staff attorneys or six attorneys. Um, and again, you know, I, I think it would be helpful for all of us to, to have uh, the benchmarks shared with us. And, and as we talk about foster care, doesn't it, doesn't it, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't it seem that if, if we aren't, if we don't have the capacity to process children's cases through courts, does that not mean that we may have foster care expenses that aren't needed? Uh, and again, I'm by no means an expert on this. I, I tried to grasp what I can what I can grasp, but it would seem to me that our best our best option for protecting children, for not having lengthy foster care, is having 
a system of court action that is uh, highly efficient. John, I believe that's one of the aspects of it. I also believe that looking at how uh, foster families are interacted with in terms of our caseworkers, which is certainly something that uh, the board has been supportive of addressing in the past 18 months. Um, I think there's a number of aspects that Cindy is taking uh, a look at more carefully. I think her background's helping uh, take a look at some of the important factors associated with that and the organizations that we work with associated with that. Uh, four counties, just in terms of comparative data, uh, were provided with regard to this. Um, each of those counties have additional interaction with county attorneys, um, but in the classification of St. Lawrence County, which is classified as a large county, our neighbor, Jefferson County, has 12. However, they have county attorneys included in their total staffing. Uh, so that makes it a little bit challenging. Uh, you know, when we look internally, I know that there is uh, sometimes an interest in seeing these numbers, but also um, it's important also when you look at other considerations that may need to be made. The attorney uh, percentages, we have 27 staff attorneys. There's 15% in each DSS in our conflict defender, and roughly 37% of our attorney staff in the public defender and 34% in the district attorney's office. As I mentioned, there's also an additional request for support staff. DSS support staff has one and a half to each attorney. The conflict defender has three quarters of one to each attorney. The public defender has four tenths of one to each attorney. And the district attorney has 0.6 to each attorney. So the value of the fact that two of those offices handle family and criminal, while the district attorney's office is handles mostly criminal, and certainly DSS handles mostly family court. So it's, it's a challenge. Certainly we can look at what those benchmarks are. You know, when we look at medium-sized counties, one county has 17 staff members, another has seven. Um, and then another neighbor we often compare to is Oswego County, and they're considered a small county with nine staff, and we have 10. Well, uh, again, Ruth, I'll just say, uh, this, is, this is my two cents, so uh, the rest can take it for what it's worth, but but when we had, we had four attorneys, when we had 155 kids in placement, uh, we are about to have four attorneys when we have, uh, I think you said 311 cases. So, so the, the, the staff assigned to do the task, which is, which is in social services, uh, uh, is, I guess, if you were to look at the numbers, uh, it, you would have to wonder if it's commensurate with the, uh, the tasks that they are expected to complete. And that's, uh, that's a concern to me, because I think we kick the can down the road. When we don't, when we don't deal, when we don't adequately staff uh, an important function like that, uh, I think that it costs us in many other areas that we we are now seeing, such as foster care. Understood. <clears throat> Mr. Akers. I just want to commend our county attorney, Mr. Button, because he went in and he cleaned this mess up on his own. And I want to appreciate, I send my appreciation for the work that he accomplished in that time period. Well, I need to say something about that. Uh, not to not to not ex, uh, <laughs> express gratitude to Steve, but Steve went in when the COVID was going. You know how many cases did Steve try? Uh, uh, so if we're going to if we're going to say that it was cleaned up, uh, there were still many many cases that that it, it's when the floodgates opened up, Steve was already out of there. Steve was out of there when the floodgates opened, and the, and the judge demanded to have a whole bunch of hearings. So, so let's give credit where credit is due, but let's not shower it where it's not due. All right. <clears throat> Moving on. Um, I would uh, just mention that uh, we are going to be speaking with Hammond 
Um, but we will not at this time be putting forward uh, a resolution for you to um, request the alternative boundary. I don't believe uh, that I observed there to be a comfort level moving forward requesting this, um, but we certainly will have more conversations with the local municipality and bring that back to your attention. Okay? Um, one transfer of funds to report out to you, uh, pursuant to local law C for the year 2011, uh, $3,905.69 was transferred in emergency services with grant money used uh, to pay for Verizon and Spectrum with some of the projects that we saw this evening. Quickly, I will give you a COVID-19 update. Uh, there have been 51 reports in the enforcement side of the house since September 1st. We are over 2,000 since March. The EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, officially closed 917. So that was last Thursday. They were open for exactly six months. And certainly, if the numbers spike or if there are um, storm events that we need, we will stand up the EOC as required. Um, and in the report on the scene of this evening, that is the backup 911 center that was made reference to in Harrogate Commons. We did work out of there and out of the Court Street location during COVID so that you know for social distancing purposes. It also gave us a great opportunity to make good use of it and work out any concerns uh, associated with having that operational for multi days and weeks at a time. The work group continues to meet weekly, prepared to increase uh, the frequency if the case numbers change. The reopening task force meets as necessary to get information out to the public. You've seen the navy blue signs. Also getting press releases out at this point about returning calls to public health, making sure accurate information is provided, but also continues to discuss the impact on businesses um, as we reopen and as we continue to move through that process. Public Health has hosted the municipal and the college call every other week to inform. That is a great call if you have the opportunity at 9.15 on uh, every other Thursday. Um, internally, we've remained at three positive cases among staff since March. Precautions continue to take place, and there have been a few others that have been quarantined, but there's no known exposure. We continue working to make sure staff are safe and that 100% of the work gets done. I did have the opportunity to ask Alexa. Um, there are 12 mass designs submitted so far. Um, so if you know of anyone, they have till tomorrow to get those in. Um, next Tuesday was the date that the responses that are received for the Smart Path update um, could attend. I have three legislators that can attend at this point. 10 a.m., and I'll send you the details. They'd like to meet downtown at their office and then take a tour. Uh, so if anybody else, I'm gonna let them know by Wednesday if you could attend. Please let me know. Um, but tonight's presentations will be located on Google Drive so that you can peruse those uh, following the information provided. And at finance next week, I will bring to you um, a contract request for approval for Drescher and Malecki to remain as our auditors for the next three years with two one-year options. Um, so I have those prices as well. That's all unless there's questions. Anyone have any questions of the county administrator? Thank you. On to committee reports. First one, Ag and Farmland Protection Board. Uh, I have nothing to report other than our next meeting is uh, Thursday, October 1st, and there's a, a continuing concern about uh, solar arrays being sited on prime uh, farmland. Uh, next one, Alternatives to Incarceration Board, Mr. Burke. There have been no meetings, uh, so there's nothing to report. Uh, Emergency Medical Services Advisory Board. Ms. Curran. He's, he's on. Okay. Uh, Environmental Management Council for the State of Terminelli. So in lieu of our meeting last week on Wednesday, um, we had an alternate plan to attend the St. Lawrence River Watershed Management Plan public <coughs> meeting. Um, that was a, a just a webinar type of a meeting. It, I believe it was their third um, and final of these, and they were uh, for public um, questions, concerns uh, on the draft proposal that must be submitted, I believe, by the end of the year. Um, so they just shared the information that they had found so far and what they were planning to report or include in that report for the watershed management plan. Um, just to note that 
when we say water uh, management plan, uh, uh, it's really a a gathering of a lot of data, um, looking at challenges and, and things like that. And really what it can be used for is further down the road to look for uh, funding grants. Um, they're hoping that <coughs> communities can work together to address challenges um, and, and just a, a common language for future development of our natural resources um, in the, the watershed. Thank you. Uh, Fire Advisory Board, uh, our last meeting was Thursday, August 20th. Um, we have a new, uh, uh, actually Rick, Rick Collar, uh, who was CARS uh, 22, has uh, retired. He's been replaced by uh, Dave Wheats from, from Waddington, who's a new uh, district deputy fire coordinator, CAR 22. And uh, this, there was some discussion around uh, fire prevention, uh, actually from the Office of uh, Fire Prevention and Control uh, with the uh, fiscal constraints and the uh, uh, COVID-related restraints that there was uh, some difficulty with uh, providing training opportunities. And next meeting is Thursday, October 15th. Uh, jury board, Mr. Sheridan. The uh, jury board is not met. Planning board, Mr. Fett. I'd just like to add what you said on the Ag and Farmland Protection Board that the planning board is worried about prime family farmland also and we recommend on numerous occasions to the towns that you do not like them on prime farmland but the towns or villages can overrule us and majority plus one. That's, that's unfortunate. Uh, okay. Uh, they won't have any any old business at this point here to be brought forward. Any new business? Mr. Forsyth. 11 o'clock at night, I get a little frustrated, I guess. Um, tonight, several instances that I've watched um, where we had people speaking, department heads speaking, and members of this board texting constantly, not paying attention to the speakers. And you know who you are, you're still doing it. Um, I think it's disrespectful and it, it's, I'm just ashamed to be part of it. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. So just my thought, I mean, it's ignorant behavior, but thanks. Um, just wanted to <clears throat> say that, uh, Tom Pristino has passed away. I noticed it. There was no notification from, uh, legislative group. I don't know if everybody knew that when he passed away last week. Thank you. I, I, thank you. Uh, that was old business. No, that was that was new business. Was new. Okay, that was new. <coughs> uh, is there any other new business come before the uh, committee? Being on, do we have need for executive session? I think we could just do appointments if that's okay. That would be wonderful. Everything else will keep. So we do have need for executive session for for appointments only. <coughs> And uh, motion to go to executive session, Mr. Akers and Mr. Forsyth.